Thus says the Lord, set your house in order, for you shall die and not live. Law, Law Bob, Bob Radio. Law Bob Radio. Welcome to Law Bob Radio with your host, San Jose estate planning attorney, Bob Bergman. Law Bob Radio. Bob has been practicing law for over 30 years and is certified by the State Bar of California as a legal specialist in estate planning, trust, and probate law. Bob is here to help you set your house in order with valuable insights you can use today to prepare a better tomorrow for your loved ones. And now, your host for Law Bob Radio, Attorney Bob Bergman. Hi, good morning, and welcome to Law Bob Radio with your host, estate planning attorney Bob Bergman. I want to welcome you to the show today. I'm going to be starting a three part series in this series of podcasts on 28 ways you can mess up your estate plan. Now, before we get started, I want to remind you that if you need to get a hold of me, you can always reach me through my website at lawbob.com. That's L A W B O B.com. And you can also uh, listen to these podcasts going forward at uh, KFAX in the on-demand section. Or you can also visit my radio website, lawbobradio.com, where you can also view podcasts and also find out about the seminars that I regularly do in my office down in San Jose. I do living trust seminars, occasionally do seminars on special planning for retirement plan assets. And I think um, you'll probably find it very, very useful if this is something that you're considering. Now, for the next three shows, I'm going to be talking about the various ways that you can mess up your estate plan. And that can be done through doing no planning of any kind. It can be done by doing inadequate planning. Or it can be done by doing uh, basically improper planning. So we're going to talk about a lot of things. Now, the first mistake I want to talk about is the failure to understand how your property is going to pass when you die. A lot of people think that if they make a will, it will control how their property passes and uh, to whom it's going to go upon they die, but uh, upon their death, rather. But most assets today pass outside of wills or trusts, for that matter. For example, if you own property as a joint tenant with someone, you die, the property will pass to the surviving joint tenant or joint tenants. If you have a named beneficiary on something like life insurance, annuities, IRAs, or other retirement plans, such as a 401k plan, or a pay-on-death beneficiary on assets such as brokerage accounts or bank accounts, then those assets will pass to the named beneficiary and will completely bypass your will. It's only other estates that you have, sometimes called your probate estate, that will pass according to your will. Now, for example, um, Bill named his oldest son as the beneficiary in his life insurance. His will left his estate equally to his three children. Problem was that when he died, his oldest son got all of the life insurance and one-third of everything that passed through probate. His other children got one-third of his probate estate, but none of his life insurance. Another problem was that while he was still single, a man named Don named his brother as the beneficiary on his 401k plan and on his life insurance. Don purchased his first home in joint tenancy with his brother who shared the house with Don. Now, Don later had a falling out with his brother and still later got married. He changed his will to leave everything to his wife. Unfortunately, because he never changed the beneficiary designations on his 401k plan and his life insurance and the joint tenancy on the house, the bulk of his estate passed to his brother when Don died later on and not to Don's wife. But there was another problem. An additional complication came in when Don's wife sued Don's brother to assert a spousal community property interest in the 401k plan and the house, and possibly the life insurance as well. This can be avoided by properly using a living trust as a basis of your estate plan. Now, another mistake that people make is to try and plan an estate around specific assets. Unless there's a compelling reason why a specific asset should go to a specific person, you shouldn't try to plan this way. For example, Bill, again Bill, had three children, wanted to treat them equally. His will even confirmed that. But several years before he died, he put his house in joint tenancy with his older son, added his daughter as the pay-on-death beneficiary of his savings account, and named his younger son as the beneficiary on his life insurance. Now, when he did this, all three assets were approximately equal in value. But later on, he sold the house, 
put the sales proceeds in the savings account and let the life insurance policy lapse. Well, you can see what's coming. When Bill died, his savings account went to his daughter and his two sons received nothing. By planning around specific assets, he actually ended up disinheriting two of his children. By the way, this often surfaces in a will. If an asset is no longer owned, then the specific gift or bequest of the asset lapses. And that could be a problem. That could mean you actually have someone who receives nothing from your estate. Now, a third mistake is the failure to avoid probate. Probate is the court procedure for proving that someone has a will, paying your bills, and distributing your estate. It could be expensive, time-consuming, and very frustrating. Probate fees and costs often run 5%, even on smaller estates, and can take typically a year to two years or more. I've covered this in, in other shows, so please uh, look into that if you want some more detail. Probate's a public record situation. Anyone can examine your file, make a copy of your will, get a list of your family members, their addresses, their ages, and what they're receiving. It also gives the uh, people who don't like the planning you did a low-cost opportunity to challenge what you did. Plus, if you own real estate in other states, your family may have to open a probate in each of those states because probate, um, every state gets to control what happens to real estate within its own state boundaries. Again, you can avoid probate by creating a living trust during your lifetime and transferring the title of your assets to that trust. Now, another mistake that people make is relying on joint tenancy as a way to avoid probate. You may have heard that if you own property as joint tenants with someone, when you die, the property will pass to them and you don't have to go through the probate process. I find a lot of married couples own their house and other assets in joint tenancy in order to avoid probate. However, joint tenancy only avoids probate on the first death. Everything usually ends up in probate when the survivor dies. Worse, all family assets are usually included in the survivor's taxable estate when he or she dies. If a couple dies in a common accident where we can't tell who died first, the law may require two separate probates. Half of the assets subject to uh, one spouse's estate, half of the assets subject to the other spouse's estate. Additionally, if you own capital property or capital assets, these are things that qualify for special tax treatment under the law, uh, what we call capital gains tax or uh, capital loss if you lose money on that property, you're going to end up with a major income tax benefit lost to the surviving spouse if the property is owned as joint tenancy. For example, a property for, purchased for $100,000 now worth six hundred dollars would be revalued for income tax purposes as a $600,000 property if it's owned as community property rather than joint tenancy. This would permit the surviving spouse to sell the property for the $600,000 and pay no capital gains tax. The same property owned as joint tenants would only receive a new uh, cost basis, which is basically the acquisition cost when the first spouse died of $300,000, which means that there's going to be, um, excuse me, it's going to be um, $350,000, which means there's $250,000 subject to state and federal capital gains tax. If you create a living trust and a community property agreement and transfer your assets to the trust to make sure it's clarified that they are, in fact, community property rather than joint tenancy property, then a married couple can avoid probate on both deaths and receive the full income tax benefit that's permitted by law. Now, another serious mistake that a lot of people make is to add someone else's name to their bank accounts and brokerage accounts for, quote, convenience. Here's the problem. Jane ended up losing her checking account to her father's creditor. She would put her father on the checking account so he could pay her bills while she was traveling. Unfortunately, he had a lot of creditors, and one of them found out that Jane's father was on her account and filed a lien on the account, meaning filed a claim against the account. The bank was forced to pay her father's creditor $80,000 of Jane's money. When he was added as a co-owner to the account, he legally was an owner of that account 
and his creditors had a right to step into his shoes and take money out of that account up to the entire amount in that account. In addition, Jane was deemed to actually have made a taxable gift to her father at the same time as the creditors withdrew money from the account. Don't you just love the tax laws? So she not only lost her money to her father's creditor, but she was treated as having made a gift to her father of that $80,000 because it was really her money. Now, interestingly enough, if Jane had a living trust, she could have had her father on as a co-trustee with her. Now, a co-trustee or a trustee on a trust is not considered to be the outright owner of that property. They're just considered to be holding that property for the benefit of someone in that trust, typically called the beneficiary. As such, with authority, her father could have continued to pay her bills from that account, but his creditors could not have attached the account for his bills. He would have been only a trustee and not an actual owner of the account. So here's the takeaway from this. When you simply add someone's name to your account, you're subjecting that account to his or her creditors. And the fact is, you don't have to be a bad person to be sued this day or be subject to a tax lien or lien from creditors. So having a living trust can protect your assets from being lost to a creditor of a co-trustee while still allowing another person to pay your bills. Now, after the break, I'm going to be talking about several more mistakes that people actually make in their estate planning. And uh, some of them you may find actually are mistakes that you've made, and hopefully you'll decide that you need to rectify that. So when I come back after the break, we'll continue. So this is Bob Bergman with Law Bob Radio. Talk to you after the break. For questions or comments, send email to lawbobradio at gmail.com. That's L-A-W-B-O-B radio at gmail.com. Now back to Law Bob Radio with your host, San Jose estate planning attorney, Bob Bergman. Hi, welcome back to Law Bob Radio with your host, estate planning attorney, Bob Bergman. Before the break, I talked about a number of mistakes that uh, people actually make in their estate planning, uh, not understanding how assets pass at death, trying to plan an estate around specific assets, failing to avoid probate, relying on joint tenancy to avoid probate, and losing control of accounts because you've added someone as a co-owner. The next mistake is uh, I want to talk about common problems with transfers to minors. You may have heard of uniform transfer to minors account or custodial accounts. You can make gifts of securities like stocks and bonds, money or other investments to minor children and grandchildren by gifting those assets to a custodian for that child or grandchild under the Uniform Transfer to Minors Act. This is commonly called an UTMA account. Each account can only have one beneficiary and only one custodian, although you can name a successor custodian, and I always recommend if you use this that a successor be named. Now, such a transfer is eligible for the annual gift tax exclusion uh, here in federal law, $14,000 per year. Uh, that's the current one right now. We're talking in 2015 right now. May change in the future. And it's treated as a direct gift to the minor. The account is treated as the minor's property for income tax purposes and can be used for the benefit of the minor in the discretion of the custodian. Now, if a minor dies, the account will pass pursuant to the minor's will, if the uh, minor is now over 18 years of age and has a will, or if there is no will, it will pass pursuant to what's called the laws of intestate succession. Just fancy legal words for who gets your property when you die if you didn't have a plan of any kind. At 25 years of age or up to, excuse me, at 21 years of age, or if set up ahead of time, up to 25 years of age, the minor is entitled to get whatever remains in the account. And you can set these up at most banks or brokerage firms. Now, these accounts may be appropriate if you plan to give small amounts, a few thousand dollars a year for a few years. Chances are the account will all be used up during the first year or two of college. But if you plan to gift the $15,000 per year for many years, there could be hundreds of thousands of dollars in the account by the time the minor reaches age 21. Would that provide a disincentive for going to college? 
Would you really want that 21-year-old to have full, unrestricted access to that much money at that age? With larger gifts, especially drafted trust, is probably the best way to go to avoid that problem. Now, if your minor grandchild with an UTMA account dies, the account usually passes by the laws of intestate succession to the grandchild's parents. If they're divorced, yes, half will go to your grandchild or your child, for that matter, their ex-spouse. Again, putting things in a trust can protect against this. And if the custodian dies and you've not named a successor, then typically the probate court, at considerable expense, will appoint a successor custodian, and uh, that is usually the closest adult blood relative of the beneficiary. So your ex-son-in-law could end up being appointed as the custodian for that account. And a common mistake is don't serve as the custodian of an account that you set up. If you make the gift and you're serving as the custodian, then the account will be includable in your taxable estate when you die. So name a relative to serve as a custodian or maybe even a close family friend. That'll solve that problem. Now, another mistake that people make is to put their house or other assets in joint tenancy with their children. I see this all the time. Why would people do that? They want to avoid the probate process when they die. Now, the first thing is, when you put your home, for example, or a brokerage account or bank account in joint tenancy with your children, that's a taxable gift under the Internal Revenue Code. Either you owe gift tax on the percentage value of the gift you've made in your home, or the amount of the gift will be added to the value of your total estate when you die. Second problem, if you go to sell your home, then your federal capital gains tax primary residence exemption, which is a quarter million dollars of gain on the sale of your home, uh, that's per homeowner, you only get that on your fractional share in the property which means that if your fractional share of the property value is less than the quarter million dollar exemption, you'll lose the excess benefit. Also, your children will end up paying capital gains tax on the share you gave away from them. Now, here's the key. If you make a gift of an interest in your home, your children receive a gift of your cost basis in the home. That's the value of your home for the purpose of calculating any taxable capital gain on the sale of your home. So, if you paid $150,000 for your home and it's now worth $600,000 or $450,000 more, and then you put your two children on as joint tenants, each of your children receive a cost basis of one-third of your cost basis, which means $50,000 each. When you die, your one-third of the equity, that four fifty, dollars gets added to the original cost basis, making it now $300,000. But the problem is that your children will each now have a taxable capital gain of $150,000. That's each one of them will have that. You could have avoided that completely if you'd put the house in your own name or, more importantly, if you'd owned it in a revocable living trust. Third problem. If your child has lawsuits against them, remember, you've now put them on the title of your home. You've put them on that bank account. That's like Jill putting her father on as a co-owner. So what you have now is if there's lawsuits, if your child's going through a divorce, has a tax lien, you may find out that your child's creditors or predators may actually now go after your child's interest in your account or in your home. You may have to come up with the money to pay off your children's bills in order to keep your home from being sold. Fourth problem, if you want to borrow money against your house or refinance to repair your home or add on or just take care of some needs you have or even take a vacation, your children have to sign off on that because you've made them owners of the house with you. And then a problem we've seen in, in more recent years is the child who's moved out, maybe moved out uh, got a good job, got married, bought a house, had kids, lost the job, lost the house, and now is moving back in with spouse and your grandkids into your house because they have no place to live. Problem is, if you want to get them out again, you can't even evict them because if that child's on the title to your house, they have a right to possession of that house, and you cannot evict them from a house that they, in fact, own with you. So that's a problem. Fifth thing is, Doing this, you're assuming you're going to die before your children. And the fact of the matter is that there are a number of people that actually pass away 
after children do. Uh, I actually have, uh, in my own family, I've lost four first cousins who died in their 40s before all of their parents have passed away. So that's another thing to consider. Another concern I have is when I see people who have failed to make a special provision for a beneficiary in their life, a, a family member, typically a child, who is disabled or special needs. You should consider leaving their inheritance in a specially drafted trust to protect their inheritance and keep them eligible for public assistance. Without public assistance, special needs people may have to spend their entire inheritance within a few years on medical care and other needs they have. And if you leave the inheritance to them outright, they might end up being ineligible for public assistance until they spend their inheritance down to a couple thousand dollars. And if you leave the disabled child's inheritance to one of your other children with instructions, use this money to take care of your brother or your sister, that's a very bad idea. That child could end up dying, which means the property may end up going to that child's children or spouse. They might get a divorce and have half of it go out there or be sued, and the inheritance may not end up being available for the intended beneficiary who's your special needs child or other relative. These trusts can also be drafted so that other family members and even friends can make contributions and add to those during the lifetime of that person. That is a great idea. With a specially drafted trust for a special needs person, you can make sure that they re retain their eligibility for things like SSI for income, Medi-Cal, which is the Medicaid program for health insurance, Section 8 housing for their housing, and all sorts of things. A trust like this could provide that disabled beneficiary things like specially equipped automobiles, uh, stereo equipment, computer, vacations, things like that. Even a small amount of money left of this type of trust can make a significant difference in the life of someone. Now, another similar thing is the failure to make special provision for a child who's a spendthrift. That's a child that you know is going to take their inheritance and just blow it. So the question is, if you leave money directly to the child who's going to blow it, will the inheritance be there to educate your grandchildren, or will it just be gone? A lot of people like the idea of holding an inheritance in trust until the beneficiary reaches a certain age, such as 30 years, or give it to them in installments, over two or three installments over a number of years. I call that blowing the inheritance on the installment plan. If someone is not capable of handling finances, the best thing would be to put somebody else in charge of that for them and make sure that they're not actually the ones handling the inheritance. I suggest to many of my clients that they should leave the property in a lifetime trust with a separate trustee, preferably not a family member who might be unduly influenced by the beneficiary, and in so doing, make sure that it's protected for them and ultimately can be passed on to the next generation so that there be something left at that point in time. Now, in the next two shows, I'm going to be talking about several more several more um, mistakes that people make in the drafting. But for now, I, I'm going to be signing off here. Please visit my website at lawbob.com for more information. Please feel free to email me if you want as well at rpb at lawbob.com. So until next time, this is Attorney Bob Bergman. Goodbye. You've been listening to Law Bob Radio with estate planning attorney Bob Bergman. Bob gives regular seminars on estate planning and is available to do estate planning presentations for churches and other community groups. For more information or to schedule a consultation, visit lawbob.com, L-A-W-B-O-B.com, or call his office in San Jose, 408-247-0444. That's 408-247-0444. Opinions expressed are for informational purposes only and should not be construed to be legal, financial, or tax advice. Seek appropriate legal advice regarding your particular situation. Attorney Bob Bergman does not offer any guarantees with regard to the outcome of your legal matter. Prior results in other cases do not guarantee a similar outcome in your case. All rights reserved.